And now it's time for our interview. Joining us today, Ethan Good from NASA Johnson Space Center works with a commercial crew program. Ethan, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Great to be here. Uh, for anyone who d doesn't know what NASA is, no, we won't go that far down the rabbit hole, but at least uh, what aspect of NASA is the commercial crew program that you work with? So commercial crew and commercial cargo vehicles, um, they're commercial entities or some of our uh, partner uh, space programs, um, vehicles that supply currently just uh, cargo to the space station, and then we're working towards crew hopefully here relatively soon. So when we think of the launch of the Dragon capsule, uh, and the Antares rocket was doing this, various vehicles that are flying up and docking with the International Space Station, but it's those commercial partners, they're the ones that you're working with. Yeah, so the the visiting vehicles office deals with all the vehicles that come to and from the, the ISS. So I've personally worked on HTV missions with the Japanese and Cygnus and SpaceX Cargo, and I'm on the, the team here with the VBO office for um, the SpaceX Crew Dragon, as it's called, but eventually it may also, it'll probably carry cargo. So about how many vehicles are docking with the International Space Station each year? And what's kind of the breakdown between, you know, the resupplies and fresh astronauts? Yeah, so the, the astronauts, they're kind of on staggered six month rotations. Um, so you get, they try and not have too big a, a period where you don't have as, as many people as you can have on the station, just so it's getting its maximum amount of science output. Um, the the cargo resupplies, you know, if everything's going all right, um, you'll have one every every couple months. And right now, uh, all the the U.S. Uh, segment uh, cargo vehicles go to um, common birthing uh, ports. And so there are only two of those that we can use right now. Eventually, we'll have two more docking ports uh, that the crew and cargo vehicles can go to. So. You know, there's just sort of the, the rotation of which vehicles can go to which ports when and, and uh, what about know. the sort of the sizes? So you've got the the size of, say, the Dragon capsule versus the size of the, um, uh, you know, you said the Cygnus stuff from the Japanese. How, how what's sort of the, the one that can hold the most cargo? Um, I don't know the the payload capacity off off the top of my head. I mean, HTV is a large vehicle. Um, you, and Cygnus can, you know, they've got the expanded size Cygnus um, flying now, but the uh, the Dragon, you know, it's the only one that's got a heat shield, uh, so it it's used a lot for bringing down science cargo, um, which is um, pretty high high visibility, high priority uh, for the program. Well, I guess that's the other part to it, right? Stuff goes up, and then stuff has to come down as well. Um, yep, and some of it, I mean, some of it comes down, it's just what state you get it back in, <laughs> or if you get it back at all, so. Right, and so you want something that does have some kind of uh, the ability to handle the, the Earth's atmosphere if you want to be able to get it in, in some form that you can, you know, crack it open and take a look at it. Yep. Um, so, you know, what goes into actually preparing you know, one of these care packages for the for the astronauts, how sort of, you know, because I, I kind of imagine, like, on the one hand, you've sort of got a, a spacecraft, and you just, you know, you throw all the stuff inside of it, and you put it on top of the rocket. But I'm sure it's I'm classically oversimplifying how this works. What, what goes into actually preparing a, a care package? Yeah, I mean, space is hard and complicated. So it's, it's a heavily iterated process that starts long before the mission. Um, the actual payload loadout is not really what uh, the visiting vehicles office deals with. We we largely deal with a lot of the guidance, navigation, control, and propulsion of the uh, the visiting vehicle. But as far as what actually makes it on board uh, the vehicles, um, you know, it's it's a give and take. You know, like what science projects need to be up when, and what cargo supplies might be planned long ahead of time, and last minute things they might be able to load onto the spacecraft so it you know everything gets, gets discussed and sifted through and you know they try and make sure that what really needs to be going up and is going to be needed in the time frame that that vehicle's up there will actually be there and ready because just like 
just like Antarctica, you know, space station's got a fairly long, you know, logistics lead up, you know, to get things there. So does the payload help define some of the the aspects that you're mentioning about dealing with sort of how the launch is going to work, how the how you're going to be docking and and uh, connecting to the space station? Yeah, I'd imagine so. The uh, you know what the the bulk size and weight, you know, if the vehicle can actually accommodate that, um, and whether the cargo needs to be inside the space station or if it's something that's going to be deployed outside the space station, and what capabilities you know that each individual vehicle might have that would certainly have a uh, deciding be a deciding factor on how it's you know, manifested for for the ride upstairs. How how much of this process is now automated? As far as the the flight itself, yeah, or... just you know, I think about uh, you know the how, and I know sort of back in the day, a lot of you know the astronauts were test pilots, and so you know they did a lot of the stuff by hand. I know the Russians pioneered a lot of doing things with computers. They much prefer to let a computer dock. How does that sort of work these days with a lot of these? these cargo spacecraft there's nobody on them right all right there's nobody on and uh you know right now all the ones that fly to the u.s segment are are birthing vehicles so with some interaction from the ground you know they they fly a rendezvous trajectory and get up in to close close proximity with the station and you know everything gets you know, you're checking things out along the way as you go and eventually it gets out to within reach of the the uh the robotic arm and you know, the crew is crew on station is the one that does the, the actual um, capture of the the vehicle we don't do that from the ground um so it's you know the, the last final bit and you know when you're you're flying there 10 meters or so from you know the underside of the space station you know traveling at seventeen thousand know, miles per hour you know, it's deceptively simple <laughs> what's actually going on to, to get it there because it's all just about relative velocity, not absolute velocity. Yep. Um, so I'd love to, so one of the other things, you know, that one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show is that you spent a long time in Antarctica. You spent many years uh, there at the, at the South Pole. Can you tell us a bit about sort of how you were posted to and sort of what your missions were in, in Antarctica? Yeah, so I... Uh... I got the idea to go, but I was sitting in, I worked on the Soho uh, spacecraft, my first job out of college. And one night I saw a, a uh, documentary on CNN about Antarctica and this new station they were in the progress of building. I was like, mark that down as, you know, something for the bucket list. And uh, I went back to school and got out. And uh, eventually after having applied uh, for quite a few jobs, landed a job as a essentially a dishwasher and worked in the kitchens for a summer down there, uh, mostly at McMurdo station on the coast. And uh, I did get to go to the South Pole and um, happened to meet uh, some of the science support staff. And they found out in conversation that I had engineering background, asked me if I might be interested in coming back. And I was, so I, I took my, my time getting home and eventually interviewed and, and got, you know, got the job offer. So then the first time I went down was just for four months during the Austral summer. And when I went back, it was each, each of the, the three contracts uh, that I did were then uh, about 13 months or so. Um, come down at the start of the summer and stay for the winter and then open the station back up and hand over to the next crew that uh, was going to uh, carry on for the, the next set of contracts, next seasons. So uh, talk a bit about just how remote and terrifying it is to be in Antarctica during the winter. What's it like to be there during the winter? Uh, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it is challenging like anything that's really worth doing. And, um, you know, the first, the first time where, when I was down there in, in 2008, that was the first winter that, that I spent there when, when the first plane leaves, you know, it's kind of a gut check, like, you know, it's, it's going to be different because there's going to be a lot fewer people around and there's the whole aspect of, you know, probably not going to get out if, if something happens. But, you know, it's you're, you're really busy at that time period. 
in the season. There's a lot of work to get the station ready for winter. And that's pretty much everybody, everybody has to pitch in. And that's why you're there is to, you know, help keep the science flowing and keep the station running and, um, you know, maintain that continuity, even though there are a lot fewer people around. But as far as the isolation, I really, I did not feel isolated. You know, I felt like living in that environment with a crew, usually over the winter, about 50 to 60 people. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I mean, there are challenging times, just, you know, people have their good days or bad days. But, you know, there's, you meet a lot of really interesting people down there. And, you know, based on whatever they bring to the table as far as skills or interests, you know, each winter was very different. Um, and it was always fun to, fun, interesting, challenging, uh, stultifying, yeah. like how that all. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just to... like for a common day, I mean, in the middle of the Antarctic winter, it's dark all the time. Yep. It's freezing cold. Is it is it stormy and snowy or is it mostly just clear and cold? I mean it's it's always cold. Um and you do get to the point where you know, all things are relative. So you know, if you've had a bit of a cold snap and it's been closer to a hundred degrees Fahrenheit below zero than you know, when it warms up to negative seventy, that feels warmer. <laughs> but yeah, I mean the the strangest thing is that it it eventually becomes normal. Like you just like, okay, you just go outside and it doesn't register necessarily that, Hey, the sun isn't up. This is weird. Cause it's lunchtime and where's the sun or same thing during the summer. You go outside at midnight and yeah, you know, it's just as bright as it. Well, just to is. give people some context here, I just did the calculation and minus 100 Fahrenheit is minus 73 Celsius. What, what, I mean, do you go outside in that kind of temperature? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, people work outside. I worked outside every day, every year I was down there. So it, it's doable. You just, you have to be real careful. And a lot of it, you know, based on how cold it is, it can uh, just kind of drive how long you stay out you know, some, and what you're doing. Like if you're using tools, metal tools, uh, you may have to go in because the rest of your body might be fine, but your hands, you know, if you're doing something that, and it requires tools that are just going to get cold that much faster. It almost feels like you're sort of being prepared for, for the, the Titan mission, right? Now you just got to knock another yeah. hundred degrees off the temperature and, yeah. and you'll, you'll know what that's like. But I think you got the beard. The beard really does the heavy lifting for keeping you warm. Uh, I had to be clean shaven except for a, a creepy mustache while I was down there. I, I was on the fire brigade, so we do our own emergency response. So we had to be clean shaven on the jawline. So this is a, a new addition. To on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it just sounds, it just sounds uh, amazing. And so let's say a person wanted to get a chance to, to do some work in Antarctica for either just like one season or maybe even multiple seasons at one of the, the bases. What is the best way to kind of get yourself in a place where that might happen for you? Well, I mean, a lot of it's going to depend on what, what your background is. Um, but uh, through the U.S. Antarctic program um, at usap.gov, they've got a lot of links to the, the different uh, commercial um, providers that you know, do hire people on, like, like myself, uh, to go down and anything from like I was a dishwasher to research scientists to plumbers to uh, pretty much you name it. Uh, if it's needed on on the continent, um, there's there's going to be somebody that's that's hiring for for that job. Uh, commercially, so that's sort of the support side and contractor side. Um, as far as how you get down there as a, a researcher, you know, you'd need to ally yourself with uh, whatever institution might be going down, university or, or research body. Um, I'm not familiar with that process. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so going to let you go in a second, but what is the next launch that we should be looking forward to? Yeah, coming up uh, in early April, we've got another um, SpaceX uh, cargo mission headed to the space station. So it should be good. I'm working yeah. that one in, in the back room, so it'll be fun. 
fresh vegetables, chocolate for the astronauts. I'm sure they'll be excited. Yeah. I've, I've heard them mention ice cream as a big thing that comes up in the and, first crack into that. And not just that, that freeze dried stuff, but proper. I'm, I'm betting not. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> All right, Ethan, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, people should check out the Johnson Space Center. They've got links to both the cargo and the and the crew to find out more. All right, thanks for having me. All right, thanks for joining us. Take care. All right, and now we'll get into the episode. Minus 100 Fahrenheit. Way too cold for me. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, here we go. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 14th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. Today, we're going to be talking about a relic galaxy close to home, Stephen Hawking's legacy, what's going on with JWST, and uh, Musk spills the details about uh, SpaceX at South by Southwest. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Dr. Cartier? Hey, Fraser. Happy Pi Day, everyone. <laughs> and podcast and day. Podcast day. It's Pi and podcast. Of course, Kimberly Nothing is the goes. Earth and yeah. Space Science reporter for EOS Magazine. That's right. And that other voice you heard is Dr. Paul mm -hmm. Matt Sutter, an astrophysicist at Ohio State and host of Ask a Space Band. Paul. That's me, and I also like pie. Here Did on you pie eat day. any pie today? No. 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 How <gasps> remiss of me. Because I oh eat pie gosh. every single day. Yeah. And so I thought to celebrate so pie Every day is pie day. Because there can only um, be one pie at a time. Did I? Did I That's I, ridiculous. You can have more than one pie at a time. I would, pie on top of pie. I would take an apple pie over a birthday cake. I probably would too. Yeah. I had cherry pie today. That was my contribution to pie day. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, speaking of, I guess let's get on with the big story, which uh, broke last night, as I'm sure we all found out by some friend tweeting at us or some news thing popping up on our phones. Uh, Stephen Hawking died last night age 76. Paul, what can you say? I can say a lot of things, and it's really hard to pick a starting point where you have this uh, theoretical physicist, decades of research that we can unpack and discuss, but then also decades of public discussion and popularization of science that we can also discuss. Uh, it's, it's, it's just just where do you begin? He He's one of these people that influenced a lot of people in the scientific community through his research, where he got a lot of young people excited and interested in science and cosmology, these very esoteric theories that also motivated a lot of people. I knew, I, I remember reading Brief History of Time as a teenager, along with a bunch of other books that got me excited about astronomy and cosmology and theoretical physics. And you know, his work, like any researcher that at his level that has had a decades long career is going to make an impact on the field that is going to have these ripple effects that will last decades more. Uh, he was, he was a major person. Oh, let's talk a bit about, I guess, what were some of his biggest contributions to the field of cosmology and theoretical physics? What would you say was the one that he will be best remembered for? Probably, there's there's a pick of two or three things. Probably his most important contribution would be his 1974 work on what we now call Hawking radiation. And I think it's going to be important, not because of the raw effect of like, oh, black holes might dissolve over time, might radiate very, very slowly. Because even if that turns out to be wrong, though what that paper represented, what that work represented was a major intersection of quantum mechanics and gravity. And this is the, the realm where Stephen Hawking spent most of his thought in his time, especially in the early decades in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, of just 
what is what is gravity under extreme circumstances? What is gravity at very, very small scales? How does our picture of gravity, general relativity, mesh and intersect with the quantum world? What does that mean? How do we navigate that? That is intensely complicated mathematics. It was something that he was able to navigate with relative ease. And this was one of the first major results of studying the behavior of quantum fields of quantum mechanics in the presence of curved space time. And that sets that set the stage for decades worth of research. It was a part of a larger conversation people were having in the 70s. Uh, he got the idea that black holes might evaporate from talking to some Russian scientists. Uh, there were other people also investigating the nature of black holes. And, and there continue to be people studying this nature. And I think it, but it was, that was almost almost a watershed moment where it showed the scientific community that results can be achieved mm -hmm. in this fuzzy intersection between gravity and I mean, quantum mechanics. That was the that was the the realm that Einstein spent his final decades in. Decades. Decades, decades. was trying to mush quantum mechanics and gravity together and to figure out that theory of everything and largely failed. And I think what you're getting at is exactly one of the real meaningful contributions was that he figured out places that you could look where mm -hmm. they could intersect in these interesting ways and have these interesting outcomes. And it wouldn't necessarily get you to the right answer, but it would pro progress, give you progress towards understanding the whole situation. But, you know, and so the black hole one definitely is the one that we're all so familiar with. But he also did a lot of work thinking about the earliest moments of the universe too. What was going on right at the Big Bang, right? Yeah, exactly. So if you look at the places in our universe where gravity intersects with quantum mechanics, there are two places. It's black holes and in the earliest moments of the Big Bang. And so he was interested in both for the exact same reasons as he was interested in this intersection. He was interested in pushing the envelope of theoretical physics. And there he was able to make some uh, proofs, some, some theorems. Uh, these are published in collaboration with John, with Roger Penrose, I believe, either Roger Penrose or, or uh, Wheeler, I forget which, uh, that proved that if general relativity is a description of our universe at large scales, then it mu there must be a singularity at the beginning, which a lot of people just thought, oh, maybe the singularity, we can avoid it. It's just a fluke, but he proved it must be there and that the only way to get rid of the singularity is to go beyond general relativity to find a quantum picture of gravity. And so that motivated a lot of further research. Uh, he, he spent a lot of time studying the cosmological horizon, the relationship between cosmological horizons and black hole event horizons, the nature of entropy and thermodynamics and information at black holes, at black hole boundaries in the early universe. Really, really, really heavy stuff. I mean, I can't read 90% of his papers because it is, it is dense stuff, but uh, he had a way of navigating it, of, of tossing ideas out, of testing them, of playing around with them in the mathematical language, just to see what sticks, just to explore this frontier of just, of just stabbing and seeing what comes out of it. Kimberly, what was your sort of first memory of coming across Dr. Hawking's work? Right. So I, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I mean, I'm as old as Hubble. So that's how, that's how I age myself or date myself. So I grew up with Stephen Hawking as even a household name of when you think of a prominent theoretical physicist, who do you think of? You think of Stephen Hawking. And that's how I grew up. So I can't really think of a time in my life where I did not know that name mm -hmm. when I was in school, in even elementary school science class when we were learning about gravity or later in high school when I first encountered, you know, more advanced physics and then in college with astronomy and I started learning about black holes. I mean, there wasn't, hasn't been a time in my life where I have not known the name Stephen Hawking and known that it was the name of someone who has revolutionized physics and astronomy and cosmology. And so, I mean, it's hard to really pick a time when it was the first time I'd heard that name because it's been so 
ever present in my life. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's really astounded me all throughout today is I've been as I've been following Twitter and all, every news site I could think of, it's just people, every scientist that I encounter online comes out and says, you know, this was my moment where I first encountered Stephen Hawking's work and it inspired me and it, it, it gave me hope and inspiration to, you know, pursue these and try and answer the same questions or to figure out what he, what on earth he was talking about in, you know, this paper, this book, whatever it was, um, some funny, funny. anecdotes. I, 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 about, I'm, like, I'm about to give you that exact anecdote. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Even like funny anecdotes of like, oh, I encountered him at, at Cambridge in this one moment and he was an incredibly funny guy. And that uh, sort of like humanized physics for me as well. Uh, yeah. and, and it's just been this incredible like outpouring of how much he's inspired an entire generation of scientists to to get into answering these types of questions. And I think you, you spoke briefly about it before saying it's not just, you know, the contrib his contributions to the scientific community and the academic literature, but his popularization of science and bringing it to the masses and becoming that household name so that people know what black holes are. And that's a, that's a, yeah. a term that is now, you know, in common parlance. And I think he was a big part of that. I think I read A Brief History of, of Time I guess when you were born. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I, I understand. I'm an old, old man. Um, but I was, uh, yeah, I think what, 87. I think I think I was like 16 years old or so, and I read the book. Definitely didn't understand big chunks of it, but I was at that point going through high school physics and taking calculus in high school and stuff. So I was able to to tackle more of it than maybe I'm sure. The, I'm sure there's a lot of people listening to this who picked up a brief history in time, read parts of it, their eyes glaze over for parts of it, and they skipped entire chunks of it. And that I think is is fine because I think he didn't pull any punches with his writing to to make sure that he provided the right level of detail to make sure that his ideas were being communicated clearly. And it wasn't like he just stripped away all the, you know, the mathematics and stuff out of it. He made it accessible, but he kept it complicated. I don't know if that, you know, I'm trying to sort of mash yeah. those two ideas together. And then I really love how he was involved in, in, popular media that was kind of reverential of what he did so he was mm -hmm. he was on star trek he was in futurama and uh, i believe he was in big bang theory other things right that he, he was there and what a great thing to have someone who clearly had a sense of humor about this who didn't get too high on uh on what on who he was to be able to sort of participate and kind of get lowbrow as well which i think was which i think was great I think it's important as well just to remember that he was suffering from just one of the most horrible illnesses that is out there, ALS, and, sh you know, sh was expected to die. He got 40 extra years mm -hmm. from where he was and, and in the end was suffering from quite a lot of health problems. I know he'd had to have a tracheotomy, had had many infections, and still his mind flew free, as it were. Yeah, I think it's it's fair to separate his scientific legacy from his science popularizer legacy. I think, I mean, it's it's super hard to tell, but I think a hundred years from now we look back, he was definitely an important figure in theoretical physics in the generation that came after Einstein in pushing relativity. Uh, perhaps not a critical player or a someone on the level of Einstein or Newton or Maxwell, but someone definitely important, played an important role. That's a little bit hard to judge, I should say, because you could say that Hawking was working on harder problems than Einstein was and was able to make progress. Uh, and like you said, where Einstein wasn't able to make any progress at all or very little, Hawking was able to push forward. Uh, so maybe we have to grade physicists on a curve as the decades go by <laughs> right uh but but in terms of of popularization of science uh and the impact he had in popular culture of taking things like black holes and the big bang theory which are super esoteric ridiculously mathematical known and understood at the time by maybe 30 people tops 
and bringing that into the public consciousness, bring that into the public conversation, making cosmology and black holes and astrophysics mainstream uh, is a huge achievement and something definitely worth celebrating, something that we're very lucky to have someone uh, like that in our lifetimes uh, to make that kind of impact. But imagine if you couldn't like write down equations by hand as fast as your brain is going to do the math to work through because almost everything he was looking at was heavily math based and yet because of his ALS had to communicate slowly and painfully using his computer system that part just baffles me that he he would have to hold the stuff in his brain all at the same time and then slowly communicate and hold on to these equations from 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 step to step but that part i just pr the practicalness of attempting mm -hmm. to do math of that complexity with those kinds of physical limitations is what sort of takes it to the next level for me well i think you certainly can't say that he lacked mental discipline <laughs> yeah in in being able to accomplish all of that as well uh i think anyone who studies sort of that frontier edge of science would be on a similar level yeah but it, it is quite amazing to think of. Yeah. And and what a wonderful way, what a wonderful representative to challenge stereotypes of scientists. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Yep. And I, it's funny, a lot of people were kind of uh, over the last couple of days, you know, you see, a, a, you know, most people are, are, are trying to keep it positive. There's definitely been a little bit of, of negative, I wouldn't call it backlash, but people are sort of using this as an opportunity to throw in some of their complaints as well. Things like he was overly concerned with alien invasion and AI and, you know, but I, I like that he was concerned about these other issues that face humanity as well, that he was, he was using your, um, uh, using his influence to get across some of these other things, thoughts about the environment, thoughts about global warming, thoughts about where our technology is going. And I thought that was really a, a good use of his, of his knowledge. Fair enough. I mean, there were, uh, he had, he had some famous well-known, uh, debates and frictions with other people in the scientific community, like 15 years ago. Uh, upsetting Peter Higgs and a lot of particle physicists, things like that. Um, and, and I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a human being is, is going to be some things you like, some things you don't like. And I think it's fair to, to, to describe that and talk about the things that you thought were really positive and advanced science and science communication, the things you thought were negative and have that discussion. Um, I think everyone can agree that we're definitely at least one positive thing that happened to humanity because of Stephen Hawking. Yeah. So if you can pour one out for Stephen Hawking, <clears throat> I know that we will be thinking a lot more about his impact on, on our work and, and as science communicators for decades to come. So thank you, Dr. Hawking. We appreciate your service to humanity. All right, let's move on. Kimberly, let's talk about yes. uh, by Relic Galaxy close to home. Sure. So uh, there is a kind of odd looking galaxy that's in the center of a cluster of other galaxies, about a thousand other galaxies. That's actually relatively close to home, only a mere 240 million light years away. In cosmological terms, that's actually pretty close. Uh, and this galaxy is kind of odd because while it has about twice as many stars as the Milky Way, all of these stars are actually pretty old. There are no stars that are younger than about 10 billion years old, which sort of gives this picture of a galaxy that started with a lot, a lot of star formation, then very quickly shut off. And you don't tend to see a lot of those types of galaxies in the middle of galaxy clusters or even any of those sort of relatively nearby to the Milky Way. All the galaxies that we see near us, and Paul, maybe you could, you know, fill in a bit more, but most of the galaxies we see near to us are currently undergoing some level of star formation. There are some young blue stars, there's gas and dust feeding this sort of constant star formation in the local universe. 
So while there are certainly older stars in these galaxies, there's also a lot of younger stars, but not so with this sort of relic galaxy or what they're sort of calling an arrested development in that it, you know, it was in the middle of doing something and then it stopped. And this galaxy, which has an exciting name, NGC 1277, as they rolls do- Rolls off the tongue. It rolls off the tongue. It's, it's, you know, it, yeah. So the, it's what, what astronomers call a red and dead galaxy because all these stars, they're pretty old uh, and they're red and they're fading. Uh, you know, if you see blue stars, th those live for such a short time that they're, you know, indicative of current activity. But red stars, once they're there, they just sort of sit there and they're red and they fade and don't do much. Uh, but this galaxy, which is in the center of a galaxy cluster, normally would have kept accreting material like sort of like the Milky Way keeps gobbling up tinier galaxies and building itself up to be something bigger and bigger and bigger. But this one galaxy at the center of the Perseus galaxy cluster just stopped, which is really strange. <laughs> yeah, and I think the, the, uh, the, the article noted that it's moving at 2 million miles per hour, yeah, which it's is like about speeding through four this cluster. to eight times faster than a typical motions of galaxies within galaxy clusters. So that suggests maybe it's just in the center, but coincidentally, Maybe it's just now in the center and it's like zipping through. But I think they said that because it's moving so fast, that might be one of the reasons it wasn't able to pick up any extra material. It was because it was just going too fast to pick anything up as it was whizzing by. No extra, you know, little dwarf galaxies, none of this intercluster gas. And even though it's sitting at the center of this galaxy cluster, which is infused with all this hot intercluster gas, that gas itself is way too hot to condense and form new stars. So even though it's, you know, relatively speaking, sitting there in the center of this cluster uh, and surrounded by stuff, it's not the right stuff to make stars. Now, is it just a distribution issue? Like, you know, they talk about how they have found ancient relic stars here in the Milky Way and they're finding relic galaxies. Like, is it just like it's a distribution like you're just going to get a chance of having an old galaxy you're going to get a star that is that has some of these old densities of heavier metals in them is that what we're seeing so like you said it's not too surprising that these relic galaxies exist and i think the number is somewhere around one in a thousand maybe ex is expected to be something like this red and dead galaxy so that in, in and of itself is not too odd I think the odd part is that it's so close to home, as, as I think you, you were suggesting, most of these are much, much further away in the earlier universe after, you know, all the young stars have died and now we're just seeing the remnants. But the fact that it's so close to home is kind of odd, but it gives us a chance to study these galaxies that normally are just much farther away. Right. Yeah, it's, let's say you're, you're really curious about the way the world was, say, in World War I or the Depression, and you know that there's a few people left who directly experienced that and who can tell you about the state of the world back then, but then finding out it's your next door neighbor or just down the street. Right. That's a great analogy. That nice. Actually, it's a great analogy. It gives us sort of this window into the way past of the universe. The way things were, you know, back in my day, but 10 back in my years day, ago, we well, but the universe not. was smaller and hotter. <laughs> things were easier to get to. But that's the tyranny of, of astronomy, is that the further you're looking out into the universe, the, f the further back in time it is, but also it's further, which means that it's harder to it's harder see, to see. Yeah. right? Yeah, and so that this, stuff that's- pretty close. This is, like you said, it's, it's much, much closer, relatively speaking, than where most of these galaxies are expected to live. And I think one of the other really cool things about this, this particular galaxy is that they're pretty sure that it could have grown into something much, much larger than the Milky Way if you had given it the right materials to work with. It has a supermassive black hole at the center that's, that's much larger than it should be given, you know, the, the end state of this galaxy. And so it gives the, the thought that, you know, it, it probably should have grown up to be a much bigger galaxy, but it, you know, didn't drink its milk or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> Only it had a chance. But only it ate its Wheaties. Mm. Um, 
All right, well, before we get on to our next couple of stories, I just want to take a second to say a big thank you to all our good friends at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the community of folks who join us every week to talk about the stories. They are providing the chat that's going on down below, but really that's just the tip of the crewsberg, which is uh, this great online community. So go to wshcrew.space and they will uh, get you acquainted with all of the cool resources at your disposal and you can join the the behind the scenes chat this is you know all of the co-hosts are in here you can talk to us talk to other fans of the show and help suggest guests and uh highly recommend it so go to wshcrew.space all right let's uh quickly talk about uh it's been what has it been like two weeks since we talked about elon musk i think it's time to have a quick oh way too long way too long quick conversation so um elon musk was did a surprise announcement at south by southwest a surprise interview went on for about an hour and 10 minutes it was done it was hosted by uh chris nolan's brother jonathan nolan who was the co-writer of interstellar and was the uh is the co-creator of westworld and has done a lot of thinking and has, i guess has been a good friend of elon musk's for a while so it's actually a great interview. I really enjoyed it. Musk was clearly a little sick. He was not feeling very well. And so he was very reserved and, and his voice wasn't working so well. But he did get a chance to talk about a lot of concepts. Talked about the Boring Company. Talked about the imminent and existential threat of artificial intelligence. Uh, which are always fascinating. Uh, but he did reveal a few more details about both the history of SpaceX and how close they came to the brink with both SpaceX and with Tesla. And it was, it was quite fascinating to hear. He's quite emotional. 2008 clearly was a terrible year for, uh, for him personally. Both companies just about went bankrupt. They lost, uh, you know, they had failure after failure with the initial Falcon 1, and they were down to their last little bit of money, and that last launch had to happen or SpaceX would have gone out of business. The other thing that was pretty fascinating to me was the um, uh, was sort of some additional information about the BFR. This, of course, the big Falcon, the big fabulous rocket, the big freaking rocket. Uh, that sure, is sure. That's what it stands that's for. That's what it stands for, it's and that's totally. what's going to be uh, coming out after twenty. Uh, sorry, after the Falcon Heavy, and so we gave some more updates on where and how it's going. And apparently, construction of the BFR is going according to plan. If all goes well, we should see the first tests of the BFS, the big fabulous spaceship, uh, sometime in 2019 and it should hop so we're going to see it do kind of like the grasshopper it's going to do these vertical tests where it's going to take off hover come back down do it again maybe move a little bit down range they're going to be testing in texas and then by 2020 you're going to see full orbital flights of this and apparently it's it it is a single stage to orbit spacecraft which is kind of a amazing idea wow. as well uh he predicts bases on the moon bases on mars and still commits to that 2024 crewed mission to mars which i still i can't believe it that's tough that's yeah, tough that, but that's kind of crazy it someone's gotta believe uh, someone someone in the audience can you do us a favor and believe <laughs> <laughs> just anyone, anyone but you know a couple of people you can just put up your hand and say i believe and then that way we can remain skeptical because we've mentioned this in the past it is it is sci-fi christmas if we get these human missions to mars by 2024 so tell you what eventually this whole spacex story is going to make a really great movie i think it's so. kind of like the, oh yeah uh, yeah precipitous rise it has the turbulent moment tough, around 2008 great, great where we don't story. know if it's gonna work and then you have the launch of the falcon and then at the end of the movie you got the falcon heavy in my spaces for everybody it'd be great it'd be a great movie it'll be close up for some reason it'll be, yeah yeah i see it <laughs> is that, who is, will play musk <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question i guess uh, 
Yeah, we'll find out. Yeah. Uh, that'll be <laughs> no, a, home a homework problem. No idea. We'll figure it out. All right, Michael Meyer and uh, Paranor's 001 have said that they're going to take on the uh, responsibility for, for belief. Oh, Okay. We'll, Quad we'll, Libet we'll, says, "I love you," but 2024 play, is way yeah, too early. One person a week, just believe, just keep the flame alive, yeah. like the Olympic torch. Yeah, yeah. That, that sounds good. Pass the torch along, and then you know, take a breath because that was exhausting. You so and then, you know, so you can come back to reality and. Yeah. yeah. The, the but the problem is, of course, that if you do believe in his ability to carry out these flights to to Mars, then you also kind of need to believe in his dark and existential dread of the robot apocalypse so no, you don't i don't think they those hand quite hand. go hand in hand they just unless he's going to use together. his rockets to why launch Sky why oh, do you think that's what he's calling he that's what he jokingly <laughs> called his uh satellite uh, internet system yeah he had yeah a, i spoke before i thought <laughs> he had a few updates on that as well which was great talking a bit about how um it's you know it's not going to be this great high-speed internet from day one but it will be it will provide internet to people who are in poorly serviced areas so we'll see how that how that all works out skynet Sky, skynet exactly he's he's fearful of it because he's going to be the cause <laughs> another well, great movie he's trying mm -hmm. to get involved and try to get ahead of it so he's trying to help research solutions to the control problem all right well, before we wrap things up paul you have a bit of an update on james webb I do. I do. You do. Kimberly does. Kimberly does. I do. That's oh, okay. Me. I thought you. Hello. Okay. I thought Paul. I thought Paul but had I put that in. Guess there. what it's gonna be. No. Okay, Paul. You you guess, and then I'll oh, tell no. you how. <laughs> get get I'm your get guess. your believing get your believing hands ready I'm again. I'm gonna guess it's the net. It's gonna launch next month. <sighs> so close. And it came in ten percent under so budget. Close, man. That would. <sighs> I wish I could give you that prize because that was such a good guess, Paul. But oh. no, so not right. <laughs> <laughs> so not right. James Webb is currently in California. All of its bits and pieces are in California. Uh, they're under. They Taking just started. Vacation. Yeah, they just started undergoing their very final stages of testing before uh, they assemble the optics and the science instruments with the uh, solar shade, which has been in California for a while. Uh, the the science and optics were recently shipped from Texas to California, so they're just taking the all everything out of its shipping crates. They're gonna do a bunch of launch testing to make sure that all these delicate instruments survive uh, can survive the turbulence of launch. Then they're gonna put the pieces together, shake it down again, probably shake it down a third time, make sure everything unfolds and refolds properly, and then ship it off to French Guiana for launch in 2019, spring of 2019. So you're a year off, a year off, Paul, which, I mean, in- That's not bad, close enough for astronomy. Terms, pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the caveat is that they're reaching the limit of their budget mm -hmm. again, again. Yes. I and, don't think surprises. And anyone. that means something. Well, they yeah. said they they swore Congress put a spending cap and said that if you spend more than this amount of money, it's over. You can't. You're not allowed. You will you will run yeah. against the Congress the says limits. that. Yeah. Congress says that. But then uh, I I've actually delved quite deeply into this most recent budget proposal. Uh, which has gotten a lot of support from Congress in a lot of areas, including NASA. Uh, and they don't mention anything about scrapping James Webb. There's been, there's no rumors at all about it. And quite frankly, if they did, there would be an incredible outcry from the public and from scientists, obviously, and NASA about uh, any sort of rumblings to scrap James Webb. I mean, they, the budget cuts a lot of things from NASA, including uh, W first, for example. Oh, that's still gone in the congressional Which, version? Uh, well, <laughs> they're still trying to pass a 2018 budget. They haven't even looked ah, okay. at 2019 yet. So that's a whole nother episode. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there's been no rumblings from Congress or from the White House about uh, pulling James, funding for James Webb uh, in my not so experienced opinion. I would say that it's just a uh, sort of a, 
fake hard line to try and get them to play by the rules but <laughs> come on you guys we've, like we've heard similar things before where they say you know you're not gonna go above don't make me count to three don't, <laughs> don't, make, don't make me come over there to california and pull your budget yeah no they're not gonna do that especially so close to launch ostensibly within a little over a year it's too big to fail it's no there you go it's now, now it's, yeah, no, it's no, 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 no. To it's too, off. it's too big to <laughs> fail, you know, monetarily too, as a, yeah. as a project. It is definitely plenty big. And it's one of those to where to fail. It's one of those where if they pulled the laws of physics now, it would be an incredible loss of face as well as loss of science is what it is. Not it's to mention topic. that they are hacking away everything that follows after james webb they're cutting exactly. w first there's nothing else other mission there's nothing else so this is it this is the last telescope this we're is ever the last get. space telescope no, no that we're ever going to get yeah so james webb it's it's still going through the motions it's keeping to its new 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 timetable in terms of testing and launch uh, and it's on on track for spring 2019 as of today. But I cannot speak to what it'll be like tomorrow. Right, right, we're, right. We're we got to hear how this whole next shakedown yes. goes down. So it's going. It's undergoing the shakedown tests, and then there'll be another update when there's an assembly and things don't fall apart, and when that gets tested Which and it's it mated to the rocket to the Ariane yes. five rocket down in French Guiana. So, yep. Yeah, we're definitely going to need chugging along. those believers. We had a bunch of people say that they believe, so that's great. So I think we're okay. Um, all right, I believe well, they'll make it eventually. <laughs> well, now it's time for our guest. And our interview's over. Uh, all right, well, time to wrap things up. Uh, Kimberly, tell me something interesting that you're working on that people should totally go and check out. Right, so people can always check out all of my most up-to-date science writing at eos.org. And the most recent thing that I've written, something that's going to be published pretty soon, about a new uh, way to identify rocks that contain rare fossils. That these, mm -hmm. these rare fossils are like fossils of soft tissue, so like your guts and brains mm -hmm. and nerves and stuff. And they're super rare because apparently the squishy stuff is difficult to preserve. So where can you find them? We're going to figure out a new way. So that's what I've been working on. That's super exciting. I've got to learn all about fossils. And I will say, Antarctica is way too cold for me to ever live there. <laughs> or work there. Major Iceland props. pushed my comprehension of what is sort of a, a tough place to live. So I can't it's imagine chilly. Antarctica. Uh, major props to anyone who goes down there over and over and over again voluntarily. Yeah because they love it so much yeah it's way too cold for me ethan sounded like he really loved it yeah <laughs> paul tell me something interesting that you're that you're working on hey we should talk about the next astro tour which is uh this coming september and you and me are leading it it's a, a caribbean cruise we're doing stargazing on the deck every night we've worked with the ship crew where we have the best spot on the ship to do stargazing. They, they're going to let us bring gear like image stabilizing binoculars and laser pointers and all that good stuff. We're doing a bunch of shore excursions, visiting Mayan ruins and beautiful beaches, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a great time. Here's why I'm plugging it. There are only a couple weeks left where our group reservation still holds, where you're guaranteed a spot if you sign up. If you wait just a couple weeks, like the end of March, beginning of April, then our group reservation goes away and I can't guarantee you a spot. I can't hold a spot open for you on this ship. So you need to get it in now. The deposit is really, really low. I think it's just a couple hundred bucks per person. Don't quote me on that, but it's around a couple hundred bucks per person. It's really low. Go to astrotours.co and lock in your spot. Yeah, and if you need to go on a vacation anyway, and you want to go on a Caribbean cruise, and then just hang out with us. It's like a bonus. We'll show mm -hmm. you the night sky. We'll hang out with you on the tours. It's a good time. We it's just really proved it. We ask just anyone ask anyone that went to Iceland. We just did the Iceland trip. We proved that it's a that it's a party. So yeah, join us. You're gonna leave Morgan and I in charge again, aren't yes. you? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we are. Yeah. That there's no there's no internet on the ships. 
All right, so, and of course, uh, what did I do? We just launched, just released a video on our YouTube channel all about artificial gravity. Um, and not like great big rotating space stations, but like little ones, like four meter across, four meter Baby radius stick. human centrifuges that you can sit in and uh, try not to get super sick. So uh, check it out. Sounds great. It's on our YouTube channel. They all right. Those at the county fair, don't they? Yeah, well, see, so this is the thing is that apparently uh, y you can become accustomed to spinning pretty quickly what starts out as making you super sick you just become accustomed to it over time and so maybe we don't need to make structures so big that you get uh you know earth gravity and you don't get sick maybe instead what you do is you just spin these little things very quickly and you just you just become accustomed that it's it's the human that becomes used to mm -hmm. spending time in in uh in this high rate of turning so so my problem was i didn't stay on the ride long enough yeah for weeks so they found for that weeks. oh yeah they found that, that if you stayed on the ride for weeks lovely. at a time mm -hmm. uh like you know you get on the ride for uh, as long as you can handle it and you do that over the course of 30 days you actually become accustomed to you know to be able to handle longer and longer bouts of nausea inducing spinning so <laughs> So, yeah, pleasant. so your seasickness is because you're a quitter. Oh, that, whoa. I mean, you just, yeah, oh, I mean, that's something that people always have said about me. You just haven't tried hard Such enough. Such a quitter. So next time, yeah. just spend hours and hours and maybe even days, like, just reading while you're in cars. <laughs> no. Acclimate yourself. There you go. Yeah, acclimate yourself. It's possible. All right. Well, thanks, as always, to everyone involved with the WSH crew. Thanks to our special guest, Ethan Good. Thanks to my co-host today, Dr. Cartier, Dr. Sutter. Pleasure as always. Morgan will be back next week, probably. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Adios.